How are you all this morning? I, uh, I spent too many years sitting next to Anthony Mohoski and I can't hear very well, so uh, when you all ask me questions and I don't answer right away, it's because I didn't hear you in this building, but uh, that's what I'm going to try to do today is just kind of give you an update about where we are with Nolan Ryan Beef and what we're doing today uh, and how you guys could play a big part in what we're doing going forward. Um, I probably don't have quite as much data as I did last time, and that's actually because it's gotten to be a pretty big bunch of numbers. Uh, but, uh, and we have a lot of changes. I, I was here in 2008, actually it was, and at that point uh, we were uh, probably selling about $15 million worth of beef in a year, and uh, we were very concentrated on producing a select product, and our biggest cu customer was Super S Foods. Uh, we're on track this year to uh, sell close to $35 million worth of product, and our biggest customer is back to being Kroger, with, but with a totally different program. And I, So I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we're doing there. Just a little background. There's probably some people here that don't know who we are. The name of our company is actually Beefmaster Cattleman LP Limited Partnership, and the reason for that is because we did get all of our initial seed stock money and a lot of the funding for the initial research we did through BBU. And uh, the, the deal that we made with BBU was they advanced us a lot of money out of their reserves. We were able to form this company. We had, for example, $96,000 just in legal fees to develop the business plan and, and solicit investments. So uh, it takes a lot of things like that to build the company. We formed the company. And the deal was when and if we could, we would, we would get BBU their money back. Uh, BBU started out with a pretty large ownership in, in our company. Uh, about uh, six years ago, uh, Nolan purchased most of BBU's interest uh, back from BBU and therefore got BBU all of their money back uh, and still retained one of those partnership shares. So BBU still is a partner in this company. Unlike most of our partners, BBU has all their money back and only stands to gain going forward. Uh, we have a couple of our other partners here. I know Gary's a partner, Lasseter Ranch is a partner. I don't remember if I've left anybody else out. If I have, forgive me. But, uh, and really this program was, was developed to try to utilize the cattle that we have in our environments, and our environments being the whole southwestern, southeastern part of the United States, to develop a branded beef product that could be a high quality product give us a way to compete with other breeds that had already done that. And that's really the simple version of what we set out to do. A lot of things have changed over that time period since 2000. Today we have two core brands. Our Nolan Ryan, and you probably can't see a lot of this, our Nolan Ryan's Guaranteed Tender Beef is our USDA certified program that we've done from our inception. Uh, it's, we, we're producing that product today in choice and select, so we have customers that buy both. We sell a lot of ground beef. We mostly sell fresh beef. We do sell some frozen beef, and we sell some further processed products. We've just started a new program we're calling Nolan Ryan's Grass-Fed Beef. This is basically because we, we never imagined us doing that. Kroger Corporate came to us and said, hey, we need a grass-fed beef program. Can you do that? Well, when the largest food grocer in the company, country asks you questions like that, you say yes, and then you try to figure out how you're going to do it. Uh, I didn't know anything about grass-fed beef when they asked me that, but I didn't know anything about fed beef when we asked when we started the company. So we just so started uh, selling this product a month ago in 80 Kroger stores. I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a little bit. Basically what grass-fed beef is, is that means the cattle have never consumed grain, okay? Uh, again, I'll have more detail about that in a little bit. Uh, also, it's no added growth hormones, no antibiotics, and that's actually easier to do in a grass-fed program because you don't really need those things like you do in a fed beef program. Uh, we've spread our brand around the store, so we sell a lot of other things besides fresh beef. We have fully cooked uh, patties and sliders. These are uh, a product that you just uh, that comes to you fully cooked, put in the microwave, minute on either side, and you'd swear that came off a grill. I mean, it's amazing how good that product is. It's just beef that's cooked is all it is. Uh, we have a whole line of smoked beef sausage now, we're doing hot dogs, and we have seasoning, and about to do steak sauces and barbecue sauces. And again, that's just a way to take that brand and build sales around the rest of the store. 
<clears throat> so a little bit more on guaranteed tender. You know, this is all about being focused on a good eating experience. That's really what our program is all about. We, we used a lot of the existing technology. We developed some new technology, and we tried to answer the question, how do you avoid bad eating experiences? Because there are still people today that buy $30 certified Angus steaks and go home unhappy. Okay? It's not that easy. Uh, there's a lot of science and a lot of things you have to do to avoid bad eating experiences. So the way our, our supply chain works in this program is we don't own any cattle. Okay, That's why we're still in business, because we don't own any cattle. Uh, we don't get financially involved until they're dead and they meet our specifications. But, of course, we have a symbiotic relationship with people who do own cattle. In other words, We've got to take your product and, more importantly, your customer's product and, and get the right ones to produce a quality eating experience for our customers. So those cattle are coming off those cow-calf operations. They're going into feed yards. And one of the big changes for us from where we were last time I talked to you is we used to have just four or five feed yards that we worked with uh, that supplied all these cattle. Uh, when, we, when Kroger came to us and said, we want you to do a Texas beef program, which we'll tell you about in a little bit, that eliminated that as an option because we just couldn't get enough cattle. So uh, basically today, I've got the statistics here in a minute, I think we sort, we're sourcing cattle out of 47 different feed yards. Uh, so we have a set of specifications. We require these feed yards to do certain things. They have to sign an affidavit saying they did it, and there's some reasons why they would do that, which I'll tell you. And then once those cattle are eligible, uh, the, feed, the packer buys those cattle, Okay, so Sam Kane buys those cattle from the various feed yards that have cattle that are eligible. They process them. Then an employee that works for us works in that plant and identifies the carcasses that meet our specifications. Then Sam Kane processes those carcasses, and we buy the beef out of those carcasses. Okay? Then it goes to cold storage because we have an aging program, which is one of the things you have to do to have a good eating experience. And then we distribute from that cold storage to our retail and food service customers. So that's kind of how the supply chain works. This is way, I know you can't see this at all, but these are all the things that the cattle have to do before they can become Nolan Ryan cattle. So uh, we're not breed specific, and that's because this is a very science-based program, and the science says that there's not one breed that produces better beef than another breed. The science actually says there's more differences within breeds than between breeds. And that's what Tommy's trying to tell you. There are some excellent cattle in this breed. There's some really lousy cattle in this breed. It's our job to try to find the good ones out of all the cattle we get and find good eating experiences. So we restrict the use of growth hormones and antibiotics within 100 days of harvest. Now that's not because we want to hug trees and we feel good. That's actually because meat science says if you do that, you can avoid bad eating experiences. Growth hormones are not a bad thing, okay? But growth hormones that are abused are a bad thing. So what happens, especially in South Texas, somebody gives a steer an implant. Implants used to be only good for 84 days. Now there's some that are good for 200 days. But the typical implant, when the day it stops working, it stops working, okay? It's not doing anything. So what happens is they get that calf fat, they're ready to sell him, and the market drops $10. Well, they don't want to sell him. So they run him back through the chute, they re-implant him, and that's when you get tough product. So basically, we're just saying you can't do that. You can't give an animal an implant within 100 days. Same thing with antibiotics. When the steer gets sick in a feed yard, they put him off in an in a alley, take him down to the, what they call the hospital, cowboy has to sort him out. Well, you guys are cattlemen, you know, we we're talking about temperament, that's a problem, okay? Cattle are herd animals, they want to stay together. You take this one guy out and send him down to the hospital, you keep him there for 30 days, then you bring him back and you put him in that pen, well, what do they got to do? You know, we got to fight to decide who the boss is. That animal, if you follow him through the chain, he's nearly always tough, okay? So we set up a simple specification that you cannot give an antibiotic within 100 days of harvest. Not because we're concerned about antibiotic residue, but because we don't want them to be tough, okay? So those cattle get treated, but they don't go back in an Nolan Ryan pen. So those are some of the things the feed yard has to do, okay? They have to feed them a grain-based diet. 
We use high voltage electrical stimulation in the plant, which won't go into a lot of detail, but basically that's after they're dead. I always have to make sure I say that because we have some consumer groups that don't understand that. So when the carcass is dead, we're running 400 volts of electricity through that carcass with high amperage. And what that actually does is just force all those muscles to vigorously contract, burns up all the lactic acid in that muscle, so it accelerates the whole aging process. It's the same concept as if you're in a real hot place like here, and we walked into a walk-in cooler from here, from here, all our muscles would just do like that, right? We'd just try to keep warm, so all those muscle fibers would do that. Well, when you put that voltage in there, it burns up the ability for those muscles to do that in a dead animal takes the lactic acid out, which is the source of that energy. So it's the same thing as aging beef for 40 days like we used to do, but it, you don't have to do that because you electrically stimulate. So then we age the product. All this beef, when we get it, we have to hold it in cold storage for 14 days from kill before we can sell it. That's a cost to us, but that makes it eat better. We use yield grade as a determining factor, and that's one of the things we changed. When I was here four years ago, we were only using yield grade one and two cattle. That's one of the things that your cattle are really good at, okay? We have good yield grades in Brahmin-influenced cattle. But when we put an emphasis on choice, and we had to start getting more choice cattle, we had to increase the amount of yield grade we could tolerate. So basically, it's a give and take. Fatter cattle, lower yielding cattle are going to grade better, okay? Think about the old Angus that you knew before the Angus explosion came along, the old conventional Angus. You know, he finished at 850 pounds, and he had a horrible yield grade, but he really had a lot of marbling, okay? Well, that's, that's that give and take. Yield grade is a measure of how much muscle you have versus how much fat and bone you have. And so, or not bone, fat, and basically fat. So we kind of had to meet in the middle. So now we're using yield grade ones, twos, and threes, but we're getting a lot higher grading cattle as a result. Weight is a big factor, and it's a huge factor that a lot of things going on, we'll talk about a little bit there. There, is, Let me make sure, I always try to make sure producers understand there is not a single market signal telling you to have smaller cattle, okay? There might be reasons why you want smaller cows. That might have to do with your environment. You got to look at those things, but don't let anybody tell you you want small cattle because there is not a market signal telling you that. Why? Because we don't have enough of them, okay? So the way the industry is compensating for you guys not having enough cattle, not having enough rain, is we're getting them bigger and bigger and bigger so that we can get more pounds out of fewer head, okay? So a feed yard feeding your cattle is going to want them to get big. And so genetics are part of that process. We'll talk about that in a little bit. We have a maximum. We're not taking them over 950-pound carcass weight. That eliminates a lot of cattle. Okay, because a lot of them are 950 to 1,000 now. But at some point, you try to get a little consistency for your customer, because unlike the feed yard and the packer, the retailer and the food service guy, they don't want them to be huge, because it makes the steak too big. Okay? Think about it. If you've got that 18-inch ribeye that we just saw on that data, 18 inches on a plate, that's pretty big. So if we want to sell a 10-ounce or a 12-ounce ribeye out of that ribeye, what's got to be? really thin and we know that doesn't eat very good so it's a it's a give and take and that's what we fight every day in our business okay is trying to find what will work for us amongst all those different signals ground beef is a big part of our business the reason our ground beef is better than a lot of ground beef that's out there is because it's all from domestic fed beef most ground beef is made by blending fat trim from fed cattle with lean meat from cows and bulls, imported lean meat, okay, and we throw all that in a batch and we mix it up. And pink slime on top of that that you've heard about recently. So we don't do any of that. Our ground beef comes straight out of these same cattle, so it creates a higher quality ground beef. It costs more, but it, we find a lot of people, especially in today's economy, where maybe five years ago they were buying a steak, now they're buying a hamburger. Okay, so the hamburger business has really exploded, and, and we have a really good hamburger, so that was right down our alley. <clears throat> this is the biggest technology that we use that's different than anybody else, and, that, and it's evolved over the years. We now use an infrared camera. Our employee operates that camera at the plant. We take a picture of the ribeye of every carcass. It's able to predict how tender that carcass is going to be. I won't go into a lot of detail, but get, we'll be glad to answer questions if you have any. 
but basically it's a pretty accurate way to say this carcass will be tender. Okay? It's not a real accurate way to say this carcass will be tough, and that's why the industry doesn't use it to buy and sell cattle. But we don't need that. We just need to know which ones are going to be tender. Okay? So we're throwing some of the babies out with the bathwater is what I'm telling you, but the ones we keep we're pretty sure are going to be tender, and, and that's a core part of our approach to tenderness. So Nolan Ryan's Texas Beef is this new program we have with Kroger. We introduced it in January. Uh, they ran up. They put 100 billboards up in Dallas, Fort Worth, and Houston. Uh, they've run television commercials. They've run radio commercials. Uh, they've made this a major core part of their uh, fight against HEB. Okay? Kroger's based in Cincinnati. HEB's based in San Antonio. Okay? So they need something to make them look like the local guys. Well, what better than Nolan Ryan? Okay, basically a Texas icon. Uh, when you do a focus group and you ask people what's the one word you associate with Nolan Ryan, the number one wor word you get is trust. Okay, well that's a pretty good statement for a spokesperson. So Kroger, even though we've been selling them for 11 years, finally had this revelation that, you know what, we got something here we haven't been using. So they came to us and said, what can we do to take this program to another level? And we talked about a lot of things. We had to change some of our specs, as I told you. They wanted it to be USA, I mean to be choice. But here's another big problem. They wanted it to be a Texas beef program. Okay, so we had to be able to prove the cattle had been in Texas for at least 100 days. But how could we make a big deal about them being from Texas and then the label says product of USA Mexico? Okay, and a lot of our labels were saying that in our old program because the cattle were born in Mexico, a lot of them. Because the te South Texas feeding economy is built on cattle coming from Mexico. And Lord knows we need them, because we don't have enough of them coming from here, okay? Especially with the impact the drought had in Texas. So a lot of our program, probably 25 to 30 percent of the cattle in our old program were Mexican-born steers. There's nothing wrong with them. That's something that we know because we've sold bulls to our fellow cattlemen in Mexico for years, and they hadn't really bought cheap bulls in general. And really, they produce some great cattle. But they, they don't, the consumer doesn't know that. And when China came out with all that melanin in the, in the uh, whatever it was, uh, you know, that just started an avalanche where consumers all of a sudden are looking at that label and they want to know where it comes from. And when you have to put product of USA Mexico on the label, it's an issue. So we had to stop using any cattle born in Mexico. Okay. So all of the cattle in this program now are domestic-born cattle. The whole program or just the Texas beef? The whole program because it's not possible to do it otherwise. We don't care on the other issues. Food service doesn't have to label it. They don't care. But uh, just the logistics of working in a plant, these cattle have to all be born in Texas. So the same restrictions otherwise, it's basically our guaranteed tender program, except it's choice and where we used to be just select and the cattle are all USA born. <clears throat> Why? Because of all of this local trend, you know, consumers think they want to know where their food is coming from and they want to buy from local. Now the good thing for us is Texas is a pretty big place so we can say it's from our home state and it still might travel 1200 miles, okay? That's a good thing. Uh, because if you had to say you were producing a local beef product in Rhode Island, you'd really have a problem, okay? But uh, they're all trying to do that. Uh, there's a, been a huge increase in the number of, of little local meat companies that are trying to supply some kind of lo local product to some store in their local area. Kroger's just trying to take that to a higher level, uh, and that's the whole reason for it. So what's unique about the requirements we have for this program, other than what I already told you, of course, the hormones and antibiotics the last 100 days. Uh, but we also, right now, are not allowing any use of a, a, what they call a beta agonist 2, which is something called Zilmax. How many of y'all know what a beta agonist is? See, that's a problem. How many of y'all know what Zilmax is? About two people. Have you ever heard of Optiflex? couple people nodding your heads. Okay, do you know what raptopamine is? Do you know what paline is in pigs? You ever heard of that? A couple people in the back. Well, you as a producer really need to know what this stuff is. If you don't get anything else out of this, please get this out of it. About, I don't know what, 
two years ago, uh, this product Zilmax came on the market. Optiflex was first, Elanco makes Optiflex. They sort of introduced the whole idea. Then here comes Intervet along with this product called Zilmax, which makes Optiflex look like the minor leagues. What you do is you feed this stuff the last 40 days for the cattle are ready to harvest, okay? And it basically turns them into Arnold Schwarzenegger. Okay, it's a, it's a beta agonist. It's not an implant, it's not a hormone, it's not a steroid, none of that kind of stuff. It's a repartitioning agent is what it is. With, you know, now do I understand that? Nobody does totally, but for some reason, when, you, when an animal eats this product, a cell that was, had decided, you know, the, the central planning authority in the brain had decided that was gonna be a fat cell, all of a sudden becomes a lean cell, okay? So it allows an animal that was gonna have a certain finish point to all of a sudden have a way different finish point. And it's just a drug, it's, a, it's introduced. And for some reason, after about 30, 40 days, it stops, the, the body adapts to it. So it stops having that implant, in fact. But if you do it right, and if you're sophisticated, you have a sophisticated feed mill, and you know how to do it, you can time that 40 days, you can spend about $20 to feed it, and you can get another $40 out of that animal. So huge, when we don't have enough cattle already, there's just all this emphasis on size. Wow, here's this narcotic for these feed yards. And they got all over it. And one company basically controls this product and controls all the research done on the product. So if you want to, if somebody like me wants to find out what does this product do, the only research out there is paid for by the company that sells it. And the reason is they have such an, a strong control now over a lot of our research organizations because they put so much money into them, okay, these huge animal health companies. So what we do know about it is it suppresses grade, okay, it, re, it makes the cattle grade poor, more poorly, okay, and it, reduce, it impacts tenderness. It makes the product tougher, okay? Are those good things? Not if you're trying to sell meat, okay? But the guys trying to sell meat, the Tysons, the Cargills, the big companies, they've got this huge problem because there's not enough cattle. So how can they tell the feed yard, no, we won't buy that, when the feed yard can make, actually make a little money instead of losing a lot of money by feeding these substances? We today have probably 80% has been estimated of the fed cattle in this country are on Zilmax, okay? Now, think about this. How many of you all know, know what pink slime is or have heard that term? Okay, how many of you had heard that term two years ago? A couple, okay? None of you today know what Zilmax is. I hope you don't hear what Zilmax is the same way we heard what pink slime is because you tell consumers what this stuff does, they're not going to be real happy about it. Uh, it's a big issue for us. We don't want to use it, but it's really crimping our supply, okay? Uh, it's a FDA regulated drug. It's not approved for uh, anything except fed steers and heifers with somebody that's got a license. Do you think that's keeping people from using it on other things? Probably not. You guys are cattlemen and you don't even know what it was. So I urge you to get online, study beta agonists, okay? Because your product that you're producing is receiving beta agonists. And it's a big problem for us because it's really crimping our ability to expand. Here's another thing that we think we know but falls in that category where we don't have enough research. It appears for some reason that this is an additive effect. So if you have any other reason why cattle are tough, and you put this in there, it makes it worse. Well, the truth is, Brahmin-influenced cattle can be challenged with tenderness. Not all of them. As Tommy said, we've got some cattle that don't have that problem. But there's a lot of them that do. So then when they get fed these beta agonists, it really accentuates the problem. So it's even a bigger issue for people trying to sell those kind of genetics. Okay? And that's why we especially are trying to avoid it. I don't know if we'll be able to keep avoiding it. It appears when you take a real good, highly marbled type steer and feed them this stuff, it doesn't have as big an impact as when you feed a marginal animal with this stuff, as far as quality. Now, it has a big impact in what it changes their, it increases their yield, it increases their average daily gain, it increases their ribeye area. It does all kinds of wonderful things, okay? And that's why people are using it. You really can't fault the guy who 
is simply buying the cattle and reselling them because it helps his bottom line. Somebody else has got to tell him that it's a problem. We hope it's not the way they found out pink slime was a problem. But it's not a hormone. It is not a hormone. No, it is a repartitioning agent. <laughs> it, and where they found it, it's, it's been used in pigs for years. And you've heard stories about when people kill a, a bunch of pigs in the middle of the summertime and they don't get unloaded right when they're supposed to and you'll have a whole truckload of pigs die, okay? Because it increases the stress because they can't handle the heat. Uh, it, it actually robs fat from organs, okay? So some of these cattle that have fat around, uh, too much fat around their kidney or a lot of fat around their kidney, they put them on this stuff, it all goes away. Uh, so it's, it's interesting stuff, put it that way. But the research folks, your university, if you ask any of them privately, they're really worried about it. You ask them publicly, they can't say anything because that's where all their money comes from. So it's a real problem. It's a conundrum. <laughs> yeah, probably. I know they're trying it with show pigs and sheep and things like that. So I got off schedule. I got on my soapbox a little bit. Sorry about that. So we're using about 800 certified choice cattle a week right now. Okay. Just because of our customer base, we only need about 300 certified select cattle a week. As I told you, we're getting 40, those cattle from 47 feed yards. And a lot of the panhandle feed yards, they're buying, Sam Kane is buying 20, 25 loads a week from, from the panhandle and shipping them to Corpus to kill them to supply our program. And what they're doing is they're finding feed yards that don't want to feed beta agonists. Okay, and there's reasons. Some of them just don't believe in it. Some of them are not capable of doing it because it does take a little higher sophistication level. We don't, <clears throat> we, we're open to all breeds with the exception of dairy breeds, and we are still the only branded beef program that encourages and accepts Brahmin influenced cattle or Boss Syndicus cattle. <clears throat> um, what challenges do we have? Quality grade, just what Tommy was talking to you about. Right now, these cattle with the 20 loads from the panhandle a week are grading 41% choice, okay? Now that means we gotta go through about 2,500 head each week to get what we need to fill Kroger's order. Now does that sound very efficient? No, <laughs> it's a problem. Uh, out of those choice, choice cattle, about 71% meet our requirements, okay? Out of the select cattle, about 65%. So one of the things we're working on as a sales team is trying to sell more select product to somebody. But we've got this tremendous deal with Kroger. We need to be able to supply it. And our biggest problem is, and, and think about us, we don't need them to be upper two-thirds choice, like a certified Angus beef program. We just need them to grade choice. We know with all the other things we're doing, it's going to be a good eating experience. Okay, So it's not a huge challenge. You know, we've seen enough ultrasound data in your cattle. There's a lot of bulls out there that'll do that. It, it's not impossible. It's actually pretty easy, but you got to not use those bulls, like Tommy said, that are showing up with standard level ultrasound information. You just got to cut their head off. I don't care what they look like. And you got to start using the bulls that have really high IMF scores. And you do, I'm, don't misunderstand me. I know you got to look at lots of other things, and I'm not saying don't do that. But if they don't have any IMF score, don't use them. Don't proliferate them, because they're our problem, okay? And it's not just us, it's all the Brahmin influenced breeds have that challenge. The one that probably has the least challenge is our number one competitor, okay? But they got a challenge, and that's the Brangus folk. They're not out of the woods either. Thing is, we've got some bulls that have got just as much IMF score as they do. We just gotta use them and proliferate them. <clears throat> Yes, sir. Oh, sure. Yeah, they, we've learned a lot about doing that thanks to Temple Grandin. You know, uh, uh, Sam Kane built a six million dollar cattle receiving facility that she designed, and when those cattle get there, they can recover some of that because of the design of that facility and the timing is important. But then what happens, you know, is, oh, we can't get a truck, you know, so all those great plans don't work. And yes, it's an issue. I mean, it'd be a way better if we didn't have to do that. There's enough feed yards in South Texas we wouldn't have to do that. 
but there's not enough cattle that fit this bill in South Texas. That's the problem. <clears throat> so why would somebody feed cattle for us? <clears throat> well, another change we made to this program, you know, the cattle are purchased in load quantities, okay? So somebody's purchasing 40 head of fed cattle. So when those cattle exceed 50% choice, we pay the owner of those cattle $15 a head for every animal that's certified choice and every animal that's certified select in that load of cattle. Now, if they don't exceed 50% choice, they only get $15 on the cattle that grade choice and certify. So this is a little over a dollar hundred weight that we're adding to the pie, basically, okay? And we actually do this through Sam Cain. That's the way we have to do it because we're not a cattle uh, broker under the PNS rules. So, you know, Sam Cain then ha has to send it to the owner of the cattle. Does that always happen? You know, that's up to the owner of those cattle, but we've made it very public that it's there, okay? So this is an added value to feeding cattle for this program. It's the only reason anybody talks to us, okay? So if they don't want to feed Zilmax and they want to get something more for their cattle, this is available. So in a lot of ways now, we're on a grid, we have an added value just like the Angus folks do. So all those reasons you used to have to fight as to why somebody wouldn't want to feed our cattle are not really there anymore, okay? If your cattle will do what we need them to do. Yes, sir. What would it do to our breed if we had a certain effort, in your opinion, to eliminate the standard carcass, considering how much ultrasound data we have? It, it would be a huge impact. I mean, it, that's the perception in the industry, is that these cattle won't grade and they won't yield. Let's talk about that just for a minute. Not, Yield is an abused word. Uh, so what traits matter? Biggest trait matters if you're feeding cattle in a program like this is health, okay? I'm not going to get into that. That's somebody else tell you a lot more about that, but that'll have a bigger impact on somebody's bottom line than anything. Feedlot performance, carcass yield, and carcass performance. Those are what matter. Uh, what affects carcass performance? Tommy mentioned feed efficiency conversion of feed, we think we're pretty good at that, you know. The, the, the feed yard guy would tell you that we are, but there's no data to really confirm that. Growth post weaning, we know we're pretty good at that. Our cattle do grow pretty well. Environmental adaptability, see that's huge. If we had cattle that graded 60% and we could feed them in South Texas, we got it because generally speaking in a year like this year, not always, Cost of gains are lower in South Texas, and you've got less uh, freight involved for where these cattle are. So as opposed to these cattle going to Kansas from Florida, if they could come to South Texas, that's where the Brahmin influence would pay off, see, because our cattle are going to do better there. And tolerance of stress is a huge factor, and I think, personally, that has a lot to do with disposition, <clears throat> which is right in with what Tommy was telling you. So carcass yield or dressing percentage. One of the, you know, the meat industry has all kinds of stuff they do to try to confuse normal people like us. Uh, like, for instance, uh, a peeled knuckle. Do you ever hear of a peeled knuckle? Well, that's a cut of meat that a lot of cutlets are made out of, and it doesn't look anything like a knuckle, and it's not peeled. So why they call it a peeled knuckle, I don't know. But yield is one of those things. There's yield grade, which is a relationship between fat and muscle, but what everybody really talks about in yield is dressing percentage, Okay. The single biggest factor in whether a guy that owns fat cattle makes money is dressing percentage. And that's the uh, weight, the carcass weight, divided by the live animal weight after shrink. So you got this steer, you sell him alive, then we're gonna kill him, and we're gonna fill out, figure out what he weighed after we did that. And the difference between those two is carcass yield or dressing percent. So it's affected by hide, gut, fat, fill, freight, all those things. And this is another place our cattle really get knocked. A lot of times we don't dress very well, okay? A real good, what they would call a real good slaughter animal is gonna grace, you can get some that'll yield 66%. Okay, that's really high, that doesn't happen every day. But 63.5% is kind of the norm. Well, we've killed a lot of cattle that are 58, 60. And the reason for that is a lot, those cattle usually have too much hide. The hide on our cattle often is pretty thick. And if you want to think about another thing I think you could measure, uh, and I know it would help you with your export, 
is hide thickness, uh, the amount of hair and hide those cattle have, because that affects dressing percent. Okay, that real thin-hided animal that tolerates heat really well that they want in the in the uh, export world, that's also an animal that dresses really good. That animal that has that real thick hide and lots of it, he doesn't dress very good. Okay, and that's the knock. If you ask people in our industry what's wrong with beef master cattle, they don't dress very good. They got too much hide, too much fill and not enough muscle to compensate that. See, now you can also fix it that way. If you get that animal thicker and, and fill up that hide, then you have a better dressing percent. I assume bone would play into that too, right? You see a lot of variation. Bone is another big one. You know, we all, I, I'm guilty of that, I confess. We all thought we had to have all this bone. Well, bone is, just goes on the pile and kills you on dressing percent. Now you have to have some, I'm not saying you don't. Again, there's all, you always gotta keep these things in perspective. But a lot of our cattle have too much bone. They're going to they're gonna not dress well because of that. <clears throat> so carcass performance is quality grade, yield grade, carcass weight. I'm probably going too long here. So, uh, And tenderness are really the biggies in carcass performance. Of course, quality grade basically measures marbling. It also is, uh, has to do with the age of the animal. So a young animal with a lot of marbling is going to grade higher than an older animal with a lot of marbling. But so many of our cattle now are under that 30-month window because of BSE age is really not a big factor anymore. So it's how much marbling they got is quality grade. Is, it, is that the, the current version of the colorometer? Is that the no, that's the old version. Uh, yeah, that, that's the old one. The new one is an infrared camera, so it, you can't show pictures of it, unfortunately. But it's more accurate. It does the same thing. <clears throat> so how do you improve marbling genetics? Tommy talked about all those things, so I don't need to talk about them. It's ultrasound, measure your IMF, carcass EPDs, DNA markers, as long as you got the data to go with it. And don't forget about crossbreed. You know, your customer, if he's using a different breed cow and he uses your bull, he's already going to help his marbling scores, most likely, if he's using the right other breed or vice versa. So beef masters can have a big impact on a crossbreeding program because they can make them grow faster. They can give them better health, better uh, uh, dis disposition, better meat quality in many ways, but they're going to get better marbling if that animal that they got bred to is strong in those traits. So that's not a bad way to solve that problem. Yield grade, we talked about again, is not carcass yield. It's yield grade, which one is best, five is worst. Basically an animal that has a lot of muscle and a little fat. So that ultrasound animal that has that real big ribeye and not a lot of back fat is going to have your best yield grade, which actually is a low number, one, not highest. But there's a give and take because if there's, usually that animal doesn't have a lot of IMF, a lot of marbling. But there are some. So if we found a bull, and I know we got some, that have really good ribeye area, not much back fat, and a lot of IMF, that's an ideal carcass animal right there. Okay. <clears throat> uh, tools to improve yield grade. So ultrasound, growth EPDs, selection for muscling. Again, crossbreeding. You want to change the yield grade of a beef master, breed them to a Charolais. Okay. May not be the greatest eating product in the world, but they'll have great yield grit. <clears throat> so tenderness is, is the, the biggie that we think we have a lot of advantage in. You know, if you have a prime animal, which is a lot of marbling, you've got a 1 in 33 chance of having a bad eating experience. Okay, it's, research tells us that. If it's upper two-thirds, which is CAB, okay, you've got a 1 in 10. If it's low, th low choice or select, basically you got between one and six and one and four. That's old data, it's a little bit better now, but basically if you just buy commodity beef out of that grade, that's what you're getting. And that's why we try to do all these things to, to affect tenderness. And those include genetics, okay, genetics. The, you know, Tommy mentioned the, the DNA markers. The only really accurate DNA markers there are right now are tenderness markers. Problem is you really can't get paid for using them. But, there's three markers that are pretty damn accurate uh, and, and probably do indicate that animal will be tender. <clears throat> One day there may be a payoff for that. Quality grade is, is a biggie, okay? Environmental factors, what you're feeding them, how you handle them, but the big one is stress, okay? And I just, for a minute, again, I said that when I was here four years ago, that is a huge advantage you have, okay? One reason our cattle tend to be more tender is because they have better disposition. And I, I, you can't emphasize what he told you. You need to be measuring this stuff because it's a huge advantage you have. Okay? T 
Tom Lassiter figured that out 90 years ago. Okay? And the industry has only now figured it out. And that's what we're doing with that camera that we're measuring. We're measuring stress because stress in an animal changes the pH of the muscle. When you change the pH of the muscle, you change the color of the muscle. Now, not necessarily color you or I can see, but an infrared camera can see it. So it's looking at that muscle and saying, whoop, this guy's had a problem. You know, maybe his mother died. I don't know. Maybe somebody hit him, but, but we don't want him. Okay? That's disposition, really. That's all we're measuring. And it's not, you know, how they got unloaded that day at the truck. It's their whole life. It's a cum cumulative effect. Okay? You can have a gentle animal that gets hot shot or gets stirred up one time or a couple times. Maybe the day's killed. That isn't going to impact that. It's that whole building, that experience. That's what Temple Grandin taught us. We kind of already knew that, but we needed somebody to make a movie and get famous in Hollywood so we could figure that out. Okay? And so we started changing all the structures, how we built things, how we moved cattle, and it's had a big impact. See, that's your problem is the rest of the industry has figured out what Tom Lassiter figured out 70 years ago. So they're going to catch up with you but because you're not measuring it. You can't prove what you and I know. You need to do that. They're doing it in Australia and uh, doing a great job of it. And they're finding the beef master genetics down there and some of the other similar genetics are excelling in their scores. We would find the same thing, but somebody's got to do it. Yes, sir. What are you finding when you, when you take this picture of the ribeye? What are you finding on the percentage basis, acceptable, non-acceptable? Is it 50-50? No, no, no. You only have about 10, 15% that it rejects. It's correlated to a four and a half kilogram shear force, which, what is that, Tommy, 10 pounds? Uh, so he showed you those numbers. He always got to watch, because he showed you some numbers that were in pounds, okay? Yeah. You get kilograms, you get pounds, but... So basically, anything over four and a half kilograms, it's going to throw out. And you only lose 10 to 15% of them. But you, here's what's funny. We had a feed yard the other day, a whole two loads of cattle. We got like three head, okay? Something's going on in that feed yard, I can tell you that. And we keep track of all that, so we got a little red asterisk by their name. We probably don't need to mess with them. I'll bet you if you go there, you'll find hot shots, you'll find cowboys don't know what they're doing, and you'll find bad facilities, okay? It's just measuring uh, stress and the ability of those cattle to deal with it. See, that's the thing. Your cattle are exposed to the same stress other cattle are, but they handle it better, okay? Most of them. Now, I gotta tell you, there still are some that don't. <laughs> uh, we, we ain't solved all our problems. We just have an inherent advantage because we started out with cattle that were gentle, thanks to what Tom did a long time ago. And then post-kill treatment does have a big impact as, on tenderness as, as well. So there's not one silver bullet. You can have an animal that genetically is tender, but if you do a lot of things wrong, you can make him tough and not a good eating experience. <clears throat> uh, a little bit about this grass fed, and then I'll shut up. Um, if, you are, if you're interested in, in grass fed production, you gotta understand it's a total commitment, okay? The animal that works in a grass fed system really doesn't work in a grain-fed system. It's two different animals. Uh, if you'll think about cattle in your own herd that tend to be early maturing, okay, finish earlier, that's the kind of animal that works in a grass-fed program. Because we're not just trying to get these cattle big on grass, we're trying to get them to finish on grass. We want them to have a good eating experience and still do that on grass. And most of the cattle that we're using right now are, are Angus-type cattle. Okay. These cattle are coming out of the Midwest. They're killed in Omaha. We, we are, our goal in this program is to develop a Texas supply for these cattle, but that's very challenging to finish cattle in Texas because of what happened last year. See, because that's the problem. Somebody gets their whole program built around a grass-fed program and those genetics, and then they have a deal like we had last year. Well, they got to sell them all and start over again. But what we're looking at and what's going on it's really not that dissimilar from a grain-fed program. You basically have finishing operations, and that's why these programs are either in Northern California, the largest one is in Northern California, and the second largest one is in, is in Missouri, is right outside of Nebraska, Omaha, Nebraska. And that's because we can take cattle from your ranches and other ranches and then finish them there, okay? So they have the right kind of grass. They have irrigation in most cases. The reason Northern California works, a lot of those cattle are actually finished on forage byproducts. Okay, and that can include vegetable production. So you, you have a broccoli plant, you cut that uh, 
broccoli off of there and you take the rest of the stalk and you bring it out and feed your finishing cattle. There's a lot of energy in that stalk if you do it at the right time. These guys that are ranching in the grass-fed business are not your average rancher. These are people who are extremely knowledgeable on forage, okay, because basically you're grazing forage, and what you learn, you can have a real lush clover pasture, okay. Looks like Cindy Emmons' best pasture, and I've seen those. Those look pretty good. If you graze that at the wrong point in that clover's life, it's very high in protein, and it's not going to finish that animal, okay. In fact, they're getting too much protein. It's not gonna, they're not going to go anywhere. You have to wait till that protein converts to starch. So like in grain, you know how you get a dough on grain before it becomes grain, it's in the dough. That's a high starch grass, okay? When it turns to grain, you can't do that because that's grain. We can't feed grain, okay? So think about that, all the timing that's involved in that. And that's what these guys do. They're planting crops I never heard of. Uh, I mean, they told me names of grasses I was looking at, I never heard of them. But that's because they finish at a certain time and they turn to starch at a certain time and they can have those cattle here, 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 and it's intensive grazing. You know, we saw 250 head on a 10 acre pasture and they're there for two days and then they move them, okay? So grass fed is interesting. There's a lot of added value. The biggest problem we have with selling grass fed beef is it costs so much, okay? $32 a pound is what we're selling the tenderloin in Kroger for, okay? Ribeye is 18 99 a pound, $19 a pound basically. Uh, ground beef is $8 a pound, okay? And that's because it takes so long to finish them and it takes so many more resources to do it and there's so few of them available. But there's a lot of added value there. Now there is a lot of grass-fed beef that comes from other countries, okay? And that's another option. Kroger wouldn't give us that option. They, they want them all to be product of USA. So some place like Uruguay, has excellent grass, a lot of, but see the difference is they can sell frozen beef. We can't do that. We've got to have fresh beef, 52 weeks of the year, seven days a week, 24 hours a day. Consumer has to be able to walk in that store and see this kind of product. That's, you can't see that, but it's a vacuum package steak or a vacuum package ground beef. So it's fresh. We take all the oxygen out. We put a label on it. It's good for about 18 days. Okay. And then it's, then they got to throw it away. So, that's the challenge with something like what we're doing. So we, we, we need the cattle, and we're pretty excited about the opportunity because unlike our fed beef program, Kroger Corporate is saying to us, if you will make this work, we need this in all 18 divisions. Okay, so that's a big deal. Now, we're only doing a load a week in this division, so it's not a huge deal, but it's, it's, a, it's a substantial upside if we can make it work. Why, do, you know, why is it good? Because consumers think they need it, okay? How many of y'all have seen Fast Food Nation? That's a problem. How many of you have seen Food Inc? See this, I get this from every place I go talk to producers. I don't understand how you guys can expect to know what your ultimate customer is look, dealing with if you don't see those movies and read those books. Because they are calling you a communist. No, that's not what they're calling you. They're calling you a, a, a uh, totalitarian uh, evil empire. You're bad. Okay, they are. If you read one of those books, you'll get angry or see one of those movies. But folks, that's what our consumers are doing. And if we don't start doing it, we're not going to understand them. And so those movies have told them that grass-fed beef is better for you. And, here's, and it is, okay, here's the reason. It's a better source of uh, conjugated leonolic acid, CLAs, and it's a better source of omega-3 fatty acids, okay? What they don't tell you is beef is not a good source of either of those things anyway. So if you want to have a lot of that, you've got to eat about 100 pounds of beef a week to get the same thing you could get out of eating one salmon, okay? But they, they leave that out. Those movies don't mention that, okay? Then there's this belief that it's more sustainable, okay? And that's really probably not true because it takes more land, more water, more resources than a fed beef program. But you know what? None of that matters because that's what they believe. And they want, they are, those consumers who are interested in that are not worried about that $32 a pound. We sell that in a two little four ounce tenderloin fillets in a little package. So it's eight ounces of meat, costs about $15. We could not believe how well that has sold. The reason is, so many Americans today are in the baby boomer generation. Nobody's at home except mom and dad. They can buy that, meat, that deal, take it home, cook it that day for about $15, and have a really nice meal. Okay? 
and it's really good for them. And it actually is, not because it's grass-fed, but because tenderloin doesn't have any fat in it. Okay? So it's healthy, they got the money, and they feel good about themselves. So why are we fighting this as an industry? This is here. I mean, we can do it, we can make money doing it, but it is harder. It's much harder. So that's kind of what we're doing there. We'll see how it works. Charlie, what do they fertilize them with the grass in their big mouth? They, uh, there's no restriction against commercial fertilizer. See, that's another thing people get confused with, organic. Okay, this is not organic. And, and organic is a tiny little, it just costs too much to do organic. There's people who want organic, and there's some out there, but not very much, beef especially. You know, it's pretty easy to do an organic apple, okay? It's pretty difficult to do an organic beef because you've got to have the pasture certified that for three years nothing happened basically with chemicals on that pasture. You've got to have every feed item you give them certified. Uh, you got to kill them in a certified facility. I mean, it's an incredible. It's basically, they made it so tight nobody will ever do it. That's why this deal works, because to the consumer, well, it's not organic, but it's close. Okay. So they, you know, they use commercial fertilizers. Most of them don't because they're using those clovers. And the, these are really good grass guys. Uh, I don't know if you've ever been to the gentleman over at Iola that uh, has field days over there every, every couple of years. Uh, there's a guy over there that raises grass-fed beef, sells it all to a uh, meat shop here in Burton. He's got 100 acres. He runs about 90 head on that uh, 100 acres. Now, he buys his calves from another producer, so he's not got cows. But it's a very intensive, and he finishes them. See, and you can do it. But, of course, last year he had 20 head out there because he buys them, see. So Texas is challenged to do that, but there are several cow-calf operations that are raising calves and sending them to these finishing operations. And that's what we envision doing. Uh, and the finishing, here's another thing that's interesting about it. Okay, get this one. You know, it's a USDA uh, phenom. Distiller, dried distiller's grains. Everybody knows what that is? That's where the corn that's left after ethanol. Okay, you can feed DDGs to grass-fed cattle because USDA says that's a forage. And it is. I mean, all the scientists agree. All the starch is gone. Okay. We're not doing that because we're kind of worried about the, the same thing as pink slime, you know, because we said they don't get any grain, but... We can feed them dry distiller's grain. So there's all kinds of definitions about grass-fed that are misleading. Uh, cavernous beef in the Panhandle has a grass-fed beef program. Who know, what does cavernous beef sell? Or what do they buy? I mean, butcher cows. cows, butcher cows. So they're getting those producers to sign an affidavit that those cows never had any grain, and then they're grinding them up, and they're selling grass-fed beef. See, and that's all. What we're doing is a very high-quality grass-fed beef. I mean, these cattle are under 30 months. These guys know what they're doing. They're paying a lot of money for them. So we really are producing. That's what we chose to do, okay? We, this is the best grass-fed beef you can buy. But we're trying to sell it to the same customer who thinks that cavernous product is great. You know, they don't buy any steaks and roasts from them, but they buy ground beef. So, Yes, sir. An older animal with, yes, that's correct. Yeah. Okay, that's true, but when, what, the way we determine age on carcasses is physiological age. So that's, because you think about it, you don't know where that carcass came from, the grader doesn't. So he's looking at the end of the feather bone, the end of the rib bone, basically that, well, the, the backbone and how much cartilage on the end of that bone has turned from cartilage to bone. So if you're looking at a half a carcass, if you've ever looked at a side hanging in a carcass, there's all these little white dots right down the left side. That's the end of those backbones, and they're white because that's all cartilage. But as that animal starts getting older, it starts turning to bone. Okay? That's what we talk about with carcass age. That typically does not happen, at least not supposed to happen, till way over 30 months, like, I don't know, Tommy, what, 35 to 40 months, okay? That's what I'm talking about. That guy will not grade as well, even though he has good marbling, because he's discounted for having what we call B maturity, or C maturity even, and that's physiological maturity.
Exactly. And now what? Now because of BSE, you know, now they have to uh, age every animal with their teeth for that purpose when they come in. So they have to keep the head with the carcass until they've aged that animal looking with their teeth. And if they decide by their teeth they're over 30 months, automatic $100 discount. So you can have the best grade you, get, you want and if you hit that. So that's, and that isn't happening near as much as it was because the industry's adapted. So we've really moved. See, that's why the quality of the product is better now until beta agonists came along because we've eliminated all those older cattle and forced the industry to feed the younger cattle. So what I'm telling you is the difference is a calf-fed animal, okay? So somebody like we have in South Texas that goes on feed right off the cow, which is typically what happens in South Texas. And he might be on feed for 200 days, okay? But he's still pretty damn young when he gets killed. He's not going to marble as well as that animal you're talking about that's grazed until he gets about 800 pounds and then goes to a panhandle feed yard. But he's still going to be 25, 26, 27 months. He's okay. It's that guy that uh, gets over that that gets that discount, and they don't want that. Never, never ever means that the cattle have never received any growth hormones or antibiotics ever. Okay. Now, what people don't realize, if you feed your cows cubes, and unless you've paid attention, you probably fed them cubes with rumensin in it, and rumensin is an ionophore, which the FDA says is an antibiotic. There's a lot of disagreement about that. So technically, even an ionophore like rumensin or monensin or tylosin means you're not never ever, okay? But there are significant premiums for cattle that are raised never ever, provided they will also grade when they're killed. It's, rest, rest is never. it's never ever. But see, there's, there's not really an, in, in, a, an incentive. Implants aren't gonna help you in a grass-fed deal because they'll keep you from finishing. You know, they get the animal bigger, but they won't finish. <clears throat> Anything else? Okay, well, thank you.